All right. I think I've got enough play in to do a short review of Banish All Their Fears, uh, this first volume, GMT's Bayonet and Musket series. Um, there's two battles in this. Um, we'll get to that as we go along in the review, but um, there aren't any scenarios except for these two battles, Neerwinden and Blenheim. Um, I'm going to take a look at components first. Boxes, um, wonderful, typical GMT. Uh, I like the illustration on the front. Um, or painting. Not sure. I'd have to check to see where that. Um, see, does it say have cover? Yeah, cover illustration. Um, Richard Simkin. First foot guards at the Battle of Ramil, Ramili. Um, very nice. And I don't know that it's going to fit all the components if you use trays. Um, it's not, uh, I don't know what they would call this three inch box, um, or two and a half, I don't know. First of all, the uh, map. <coughs> it's got two sides to it, obviously. Um, this is the Blenheim side. Um, it's, it's a nice map. It's, it's not anything fancy. It doesn't need to be. Um, but the, what I like are the hexes are, um, or I should say the terrain in the hex is enough to delineate what it actually is. If I could um, show you by these, these counters. Um, so if a, if a unit is in a hex, you can see um, that it's that type of terrain. There's not a lot of guessing going on. Um, the most important thing on the map, unlike a lot of games you'll see, are these delineations, the dashed lines, if I can zoom in, these red dashed lines that run all the way up um, to the top of the map, and those all delineate wings of each army. Um, and those correspond to your um, brigade card. I call it the brigade card because that's where the brigade counters go. And you can see the separate wings. Um, this is Nierenden. Here's Blenheim. Um, notice a little bit of a difference here. The, the positioning you have um, a medium size wing here and the large wing is is here on Blenheim second from the right and then on the uh, near Vinden map the plains is the biggest wing where you can fit the most brigades um, so it does match up uh, which is absolutely necessary when you're when you're um, moving and when you're switching wings with various brigades. Um, again, the, the map is, is very good. Um, there's not tons of, um, of terrain besides the forest up here in Blenheim and the few, few villages and then the, um, the streams and this is a larger river. And then on the near Vinden map, it's even less of a terrain because you don't have a lot of forest, just a couple patches. Um, and the, the one thing you'll really, really notice maybe for p people playing tactical games of, you know, 1700 through um, the 18, well, late 19th century, um, there's no, no um, elevation at all. 
so you don't have to worry about um, hills and whether you can see through over a hill, blind spots, etc. So you don't have to worry about elevation, just blocking hexes for artillery. Uh, so maps great. Um, one other little detail, just you can zoom in if you didn't watch any other videos. This is the the blue line here on the Vinden is where the French need to to um, stay behind when they start out and the same for the red line for the allied sign side and then <clears throat> blenheim i believe has optional um there's a blue line and then i think uh this dotted line and then i think there's a more aggressive stance that can happen by being up farther with this kind of purplish. I, I think that what that ends up being is a mixture of the red and blue. I haven't done the the um, Blenheim scenario, but I, I think I remember seeing that. Uh, so that's the map. Counters are typical high quality GMT. Um, they're the larger size, which I'm happy for um, because it would get even more dense if they were smaller. Although I, I suppose if, you, if they were smaller, you might be able to um, place two. If the hexes are a little bit bigger and the, the counters are smaller, you'd be able to place two side by side or one behind another. Um, that's one thing. I'd, I might address later is possibility of uh, lightening up on the density. Um, any case, um, pretty thick actually. Um, two sides. The front side is full strength. The bottom right number uh, I've talked about in other videos. That's the strength, um, the firing strength. GE is uh, nationality. Um, two slash two just means it's the second um, second uh, battalion of this particular brigade, two of two. Um, you can see that this is horse, um, maybe not. If you zoom in on your your screen, you can see there are horses there. But the quickest way, we talked about this before, the difference between the two, um, the infantry is straight across in their picture and then the, the cavalry is split in two. Um, and the only other one you'll find besides the artillery, um, there's an artillery counter. And the only other one, uh, one you'll find is dragoons, which uh, if I can see, um, they have dragoons. If they're unmounted, they're they're in three groups of three. I think I've got one close by here. Whoops, yeah, I had it. Here. Now these are split into three. They are um, this unmounted, dismounted dragoons, and then they have a. a partner counter that is uh, cavalry if, they, if they're mounted up. Okay, so counter is very nice. Um, there's a lot of info on it. So some info that you, you probably have to get used to, take a look at the opening couple pages where it talks about what each of the numbers mean. Um, because the battalion counters, which are actually doing the fighting on the hex map, a um, little bit different setup than the actual brigade, which goes on the brigade um, chart where you're moving them from wing to wing and front to back. Um, so just get familiar with it. It's a little bit different than any other games you may have played. Um, so counter is very, very nice. Um, 
kind of unique to this game, but um, has all the information you really need. Um, the player's aids are great. There's two for each of the, I'm not gonna grab both of them, but there's two, two of the um, fire charts, infantry, and let's zoom out a little bit. Infantry and artillery on the back side, the cavalry. Make sure you're on the correct side. Uh, during the gameplay, I was on the side. Couldn't figure out why, what these were when we were doing an infantry attack. Um, the all the, the there's not one thing you'll find in this game is there's not tons of modifiers when you attack. Um, you can see the CV combat value modifiers here. There's not a lot. Um, you have to get used to how they deal with flanks um, and how what what creates an advantage or a disadvantage for the um, attacker and slash defender. So um, that's important to to get get under your and in your brain. Um, Tillery is very very. Um, very simple to understand. It's a little bit different. We take a look at the results uh, before you start playing so you understand what the use of the artillery will be. Um, that's a little bit of what I talked about in my gameplay videos. But it's a very easy chart to, to use. Um, and they only and you, and you only use one at a time. Um, and you also get two of these, the command and movement tables. Um, this is really, really helpful here when you're changing orders. You just, if you're in front um, and you're under a charge order and you want to switch to march, you're going to have to roll a one unless you're under direct command. And then it will pr probably be a two or a three. Um, yeah, this is, this is really useful. Um, I probably didn't play enough yet to get this under my belt, so I didn't have to use this, but it really is, it doesn't take that long. Quick glance can tell you what you're going to need to roll. Um, the wing actions, when you're transferring or moving a brigade up or back within between lines. Um, terrain effects chart, there's not tons of terrain, so it's um, not a lot to to be concerned with but it's helpful um, and then this the charge uh, side and leaders I think most once you've read the rules tried some things out then these two players aids are all you're gonna really need um, that'll tell you everything as you're playing and, th and it's helpful because it at least for me this is unlike anything really I've ever played um, I'm, I'm not sure what I would compare it to um, let's see rule book okay rule book is excellent uh, again because it's so different I think it would it would help to just start I mean read the introduction, um, understand a little bit of the history behind this, these two battles um, and what they're trying to do, what the designer's trying to do, and then just go very carefully through every single page. Um, don't skip things. Um, you're probably gonna have to go through again. I, I did, especially when I started playing, but I think you just have to take it step by step because it's not really, I mean, we're talking 19, 20, 21 pages with a lot of illustrations, um, a lot of highlighted things. It's, it's very well, well done in that respect. I mean, this is a great chart here um, talking about how, uh, what I love about this is um, this is a small little shot of the brigade um, chart that you have out on your table. 
and then this shows you what it might look like on the hex map so this this translates into this kind of explodes so this is just the brigade representative counter and then these are the actual units that are going to be doing the actions on on the board so i this this is one of the best graphics i can um, recommend to, to study um, and then the, the one on the same page on the bottom because you have to worry about brigade integrity and line integrity this gives you examples of places where you do not have integrity or there's something wrong and it tells you exactly why it's wrong um, so this one I really really um, took a look at it helps a lot um, it's just I, I think as I said it's not a long rule book but it's so different Th things like this committing brigades that's in passage of lines relief in place those are concepts I've never dealt with before. Um, and the orders, we've, we've all, a lot of us have dealt with orders in Napoleonic and Civil War games, but this is a little bit different. Um, so again, take a look at this. This red box is really important. I would, I would say my one, um, I don't know, I had a little bit of a difference of opinion here about one sentence. Um, in that says, um, where was that? Um, uh, where does it say charge? Oh no, it's not in the charge order. Charge order is fine. I was, I was thinking about um, the initial volley which is something that's, again, is new to me. Um, and the sentence I was, I was puzzling about before, but the, the developer was very kind to, to give me um, some clarification. And it's this one that says, the initial volley may be used when an infantry battalion performs an attack or when defending against any unit that does not use its initial volley in its attack. Um, and I understand how it's used or what, what the process is for doing the initial volley. I just, when I saw maybe, I took that as an option, like it's, it's, it would be okay and it's your choice to, to do the initial volley when you attack. But um, he explained to me, Mike explained to me that this, it just is saying when it actually happens. So it's not an option. If you attack and you have an initial volley available, you have to use it. The same thing goes when, when the defender is going up against a unit that didn't use an initial volley in its attack. And that, that happens because if, um, even though it's required, you might have used it already, and then you're attacking again. Say you're attacking a an infantry battalion that still has an uh, initial volley, and then on the the subsequent turn, um, that the defender can use their initial volley. Actually, should use their initial volley if they're going to counterattack. So, basically, if you're going to attack one way or the other you have to use your initial volley if it's available and um, just to remember if, you, in, if you're getting into this game once you use your initial volley um, I'll show you that on this counter here you have to flip and you'll go to a less CV a less combat value because it was three now it's two so they no longer have initial volley. They'll never be able to, even rallying, they can't go back to the side because, um, and, and it's kind of cool because it, it teaches you something about this um, particular period that they were geared up for that first um, big volley before they ever met the opposing side. And once they've used that up, you can't um, get back to it. There's just no way. So. During that, during that battle. 
Um, so I, I, it's kind of a cool, cool idea. Um, watch the gameplay video if, if you've got any of the questions about that. But anyway, the, the rule book I think is very well done. Um, any questions I've had, it's usually because I missed a sentence. Um, and I can't stress enough that getting into this for the first time, if you've never done anything like it, it's going to be new and so you're, you're going to miss some things um, and then just go back and double check. Um, but it's, it's all the answers are here. Let, let me put it that way. And then the playbook is <laughs> probably one of the best playbooks I've seen. And not because it has a bunch of scenarios. It only has the two battles. Um, the only option you have are, is in Blenheim. You can do a little bit different with a startup for the French. Otherwise, it's two battles, um, and I haven't read it from cover to cover. I've read more about the Nirvinden battle that I um, that I tried out first, and it's just uh, like a labor of love. I think that, um, in in some respects, you know. A good chunk of the price and this is not an expensive game it's not um, especially if you've got it in a p500 um, but this playbook is worth um, a good chunk of that cost I mean it's worth it um, I don't know how much time was spent getting into this but it, and it's it's I think a, a fantastic thing because the designers and developer in in my mind i'm just trying to take take it from their perspective because this is kind of an unknown period of warfare for a lot of people who who game um it's it's really helpful to give this much background so you can appreciate what's going on here in the system um, so the playbook is incredible. I, it, it has all this background information on each battle and then set up, read carefully the setup instructions. I kind of blew it on Nirvinda to start. Um, and it had to do with the, um, I think the cavalry brigades. Um, this is an example. They give you a nice example for this first battle of what it might look like on the brigade chart. That's nice. Um, gives you command structure. Um, tells you where the commanders are going to be. Um, hit the details and the full name of the commanders and then w what their fate was. That's um, pretty cool. Um, talks about what, what the developers have and designers have found out historically about the setup. Um, this is important. This first chunk tells you exactly a uh, particular brigade, what line it's going to be in, um, and how many battalions it has. That's also the, the number of battalions will be on the brigade counter as well. Um, this, all this detail, I mean, if you just read this, um, and knowing about the specific uh, regiment established in 1655 under Scott and Hugh McKay in 1677, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, to have that much detail about each of these regiments, that's crazy. Um, now, when you get to this regimental listing, um, some of these will be optional as to, as to where you're going to place them. But again, read the, read the opening um, directions about starting placement carefully because I missed one, one sentence. And then the French order of battle, all this detail. <laughs> um, you you could take, take a big chunk of your time just if you really are interested in some of this background. Um, Swiss and foreign troops in the French army. 
and then it gets into Blenheim, which is a, maybe a little more familiar with a lot of us. Um, again, I'm not that familiar, but that one I actually heard of before I got the game. Tons of historical inform information on this, the results of the battle, um, special rules, order of battle, etc. And then, I mean, this is, we're on page 45. <laughs> Oops, let's go, to, yeah, okay, the very order of battle. Historical notes. Um, look at this cavalry formations. If you want to know why uh, things play out the way they do or some of the restrictions you have as you play the game, read through this. Um, I, this, is, this is like a book. Um, and then that was historical notes. Then you have designer notes talking about what changed from the Musket and Pike era, um, which you have in their other series. But it's quite different. Um, key design features. <laughs> I think, I, in my mind, the designer's developer would probably knew that people were going to be, hey, what's this? What, what is this? Uh, and, and so they gave a lot of this background information in order to justify um, taking the time to get into it. And I, I think that was very, very wise. Very good uh, example of play. Um, it's just uh, bibliography, websites, and then uh, counter manifest, which is always nice to have. A picture of the two maps, and then sequence of play, which you can have just. Um, is there not that? I mean, it gives a little bit more detail. They have a uh, card, where is it, um, that shows you the sequence of play and you can just move your counter along. After, I mean, after first couple times, I I was like, I didn't even bother doing this because um, it's pretty it's pretty easy to remember. Um, it's cool, it starts with the artillery and then um, wing activation brigade, that's the biggest, this takes the most time and then routed takes very little time. Victory check is very easy. <laughs> um, it's not like counting up victory point hexes. So, and reset. Uh, it's very plays very fast that way. This again, this will take your most time. These are take thirty seconds. Um, artillery does it takes a couple minutes. Wing activation takes a little bit of decision making time and a few die rolls. Um, but yeah, it's a fantastic playbook. Highly recommended. Um, and then my conclusions, um, I I just have to say, um, for, well, first of all, as far as gameplay goes, um, I think this game will benefit from playing several times. Now you, in, in other words, I think it will get better as you understand it more. It will get to be more fun to play. Um, the biggest hurdle people are going to have is setting it up. And I think um, when you look carefully at the example and then um, just get the pieces out, sorting is important. Um, I sorted them according to their wings. I can fit probably a couple. I could maybe squeeze more, but I, I fit like two brigades and all their battalions in one um, tray holder. So it took up it took up two trays. Um, you could probably do with less. You could do this with baggies. I'm, I've got the trays, so it's not a big deal. The only problem is this is just just is just near Vinden. Um, Blenheim is actually a little bigger, I think. Um, although I don't have 
uh, I've got, well, no, I've got all these counters I just put in bags. These are just markers for charging and casualties, etc. cetera. Um, I haven't punched Blenheim yet. You can see there's two and a half, not quite two and a half sheets. Um, so, and I, and I want to play Blenheim, so that'll be the next thing when I, I take this out again. Um, I don't know if, I maybe baggies would be a very better solution. You could put all, all the, um, let's say the French uh, planes wing, the center wing for this one battle in one baggie. Um, maybe that would help. Um, I'd like to fit it all, all in the one box, but I definitely can't do that with, with the two battles the way I have it here. Then I'd have four trays, so. Um, yeah, I, it, gameplay is different. And what I enjoyed was the, at first that it, it felt like there wasn't a lot of things happening. I think that that that's, might be how things play out. Um, especially when you first play it, it's like you, you have to be careful in the battle I played because the center wing it has a big fortification which is hard to get through. But there are ways to approach the gaps and, and come from, a, from the right wing for the French and possibly exploit that. And then I think once, once you break through, the, um, you can see how the cavalry would make a big difference as they, they go forward and charge. So um, it's, it's, I don't know, if it, would you call it a set piece battle? Um, it's very formal. Um, and you have some restrictions on what you can do, but that's kind of fun too. I mean, you just can't, okay, I'm going to switch a brigade. Um, uh, let's put the map on, I'm just gonna show you. This is, what, this is what happened in the first time I played. Um, I had some cavalry brigades here in my, my support line. And I, <clears throat> I had a chance to take advantage of opening or to push this harder, but my frontline units were kind of exhausted. The problem, and they were also in a firefight. Several of them were in firefights, and you can't get out of a firefight unless you can roll for dress ranks. You've got to get a dress ranks command change and then go back. And then you can, and you can't, you can't order. Um, a relief in place until they're one step, they're not engaged with the enemy. So I was trying to get them disengaged and at the same time waiting for that to happen so I could do a roll to do the relief in place. And then I finally got them disengaged and I failed the roll to do the relief. So even though that was frustrating, it was like kind of cool to watch that play out because in this game, you just can't um, throw another brigade into the action. Um, and I, I like the way the command works in that sense. It just plays out differently than some of the other tactical, say, Napoleonics and Civil War um, games play when, when you're talking about command and command control. So. Um, it's quite a different game, but I like it, and I'm, I'm definitely going to keep it because it's it just um, it's so different that I think when I'm in the mood for that kind of thing, this will this will hit the spot um, where some other ones are are not going to, and um, so it'll be I, I'll be interested to see how it develops and what some of the other battles they they start to uh, cover so i again this may not be for everybody but i think for people who are um, willing to take a chance and you have to get it set up and go through some turns and really force yourself to get through a game where there is a breakthrough or somebody one side or the other is obviously going to win. You don't have to go. I, I, I think that was interesting that they put that in the victory conditions. Um, if 
if say the center wing, all the um, brigades route, then the other side wins or, the, or both of the wings or whatever. But it also says when or when one side surrenders. And that seems like, well, is that a cop out? Well, no, I don't think it is because you can see at a certain point, that's what happened in, in my game, where the allied side is not going to be able to come back from a, a breakthrough. Um, and then you don't have to play out the full 20 some turns because that's what it'll be if you play out the whole thing. Um, I think, I don't know, it was like 740 um, when that when this battle started and it goes till five or something like that, but it, or four, but there's three turns per hour. So you can see, let's just say it started at eight, one, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's just say it was nine. And there are three turns per hour, that's 27 turns. In this game, that's kind of a lot, I think. It, I, that would be a number of hours if you actually played that that far in. But I don't think it's ever gonna get to that. I think you're, you're either gonna have the French break through and it's gonna be obvious the Allied can't, can't do a whole lot more to stop that. Um, or the French will just get played out and they just won't have any strength enough to um, go any farther. So, and that I should make that clear in the victory conditions, if no one achieves the victory conditions, then the Allied win. So the, the French are obviously being pushed to attack um, in, this, in this battle anyway. So, so that's my thoughts. I, again, I, I recommend the game for people who are going to um, take the time to get into the rules you got to set it up and, and honestly if you get it set up it takes a little while to set up and so once you do that um, I think it's it's important that you follow through and and get through a, a bunch of turns so you can see how it plays um, and it, again it's just like anything else the, the more you get into each turn the faster it goes because you there are some things um, that you don't have to worry about that you know as far as the brigade activation technically you could have like 40 brigade activations but a lot of times you're going to see brigades that are just passively waiting especially if they're in the back two lines they're not going to be moving around that much maybe little adjustments here or there so um, yeah hope that helps some of you might be sitting on the fence um, or some of you may have the game like we all do, we get a game and then we're like, hmm, am I wanting to get into this? Well, I hope that that gets you started to try some things out on this Banish All Their Fears. Thanks, and I'll see you next time. Bye.